Hi. It's a very intimidating crowd. I'm excited to be here. Um, how many people here actually know about 20 by 200? OK, that's amazing. And it kind of ruined my, I was going to say, I, I figured about half of you would raise your hands. And I would say, tell the person next to you who doesn't know about 20 by 200 about it, and then come to me and tell me how I can make it better. If all of you come to me, that will be a problem. But send me an email. Um, Live with art, it's good for you. This is a letterpress print that was done um, on our one year anniversary by um, a designer named Mikey Burton, who maybe some of you guys know. Um, <clears throat> and it's a simple premise that has driven a lot of what I've done for the past 10 years. Uh, it seems simple. Um, however, this is really sort of what stands between many people and living with art, which is a kind of gallery experience that's very opaque and very intimidating and very unwelcoming. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, what you have for people is, you know, if you go to look for art on your own, you're sort of greeted with a sea of crap. It's posters, it's, you have to like kind of dig through so much stuff to get to anything good and the quality and the, there's not, there's just not a connection to the people who make it and there's not really a sense of treating people who don't have $10,000 or $20,000 or $100,000 or $1 million dollars to spend um, with respect and with the expectation that they want to engage in art the same way that a uh, you know, mega wealthy collector might want to engage in it. <clears throat> this made me really crazy um, as a marginally employed uh, dot-com refugee before I opened the gallery. And uh, so naturally, like to address this problem, what I did was, um, you know, I, I, I was really sort of like trying to figure out how can we create a world where everyone lives with art, where everyone is really collecting art and, um, you know, the, the tagline for 20 by 200 is art for everyone. And the sort of sub tagline is that when we say art, we really mean art. And when we say everyone, we really mean everyone. Uh, and trying to kind of mediate between the, <clears throat> trying to mediate between sort of really authentically being art and connected to the art world for all its flaws, because it's important for the artists, and it's also important for the collectors on the other end, and then really figuring out how to connect a really broad audience with art and make them feel like buying art is something they can and should do, and making them feel like they can participate in patronage. So these are the goals that I had when I opened my gallery on the Lower East Side um, in 2003. Uh, and as you can see, it's quite small. It's about 300 square feet. Uh, <clears throat> I managed to make it bigger because I had experience in the internet and sort of blogged from the start and uh, managed to kind of expand our community and bring people there more effectively than I would have been if I had been someone who hadn't been in the internet business before I owned an art gallery. But it was very limiting. Um, I, I had this idea when I opened it that it was going to be a place where people would feel comfortable walking through the door and we would be warm and welcoming, but we would have a totally credible program and you know, do art fairs and have reviews in the New Yorker and the New York Times. And, and we did all that, but people came through the door with so much baggage that I couldn't address um, because ultimately the proposition was, <clears throat> you're going to buy that piece of art on the wall for me. It's $2,000 because I say so. You probably can't return it. Um, and if you don't like it, you're probably stuck with it because even though a lot of dealers will have you think otherwise, it's actually really hard to sell a piece of art once you spent a bunch of money on it. This was really frustrating both because as an entrepreneur, I didn't really have the resources to keep the gallery going. Um, and so seeing people not buy art was both sort of spiritually depressing but financially oppressive. Um, <clears throat> and I would, I would look at people and I would say, I know that they can afford it. If I can just kind of get them engaged with an authentic experience, then that will get them hooked and it'll give them a point of entry and I can get more people collecting art. So one day I had this idea of what I call, that's a marijuana leaf, in case anybody doesn't know. <laughs> um, the most succinct definition I have of 20 by 200 when I started it five years ago and today is that our $20 print is the gateway drug of the art world. Who doesn't have $20 to spend? Like a city, you know, there are plenty of people who don't have $20 to spend. I will, you know, preface it with that. But if you sort of think about the people that I was dealing with um, and also everybody in this room, um, you can spend $20 without, you know, sort of getting really crazy about uh, what you're spending. It doesn't feel like a 
perilous leap over a cliff. And so we thought that, the, the thought was, well, if somebody can buy a piece of art for $20 and they can really feel like they're a collector with that experience, that will get them hooked on it and we'll have something for them when they come back for more. Um, this is an example of the sort of unboxing of, um, of a 20 by 200 print. Uh, this is a Mike Montero uh, piece. Um, you'll see it has a certificate of authenticity. It comes in kind of consumer-friendly packaging. It also comes with an artist's bio and statement. And so one thing that was very important from the start was that whether somebody's spending uh, $20 on the site or spending $10,000 on the site, that we're going to give them all the sort of visual trappings and all the material and information that they would normally get if they spent a lot of money at, at a gallery, even if they were spending very little money to begin with. And this is another sort of, and actually these are not photos I took. If you kind of go through Flickr, you see that people enjoy unboxing their 20 by 200 prints, which is very exciting. Um, and the art world is not a world that has unboxing. I figure people here maybe know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Just guessing. Um, and actually, I am happy to say that it worked because the internet, as we learned from Dan Harmon yesterday, it is a connector. Um, and what it allowed me to do and us to do was connect with people with something about something that they have a lot of anxiety about, which is art. Because again, kind of going back to the gallery days, <clears throat> it wasn't just that I, I could create an environment that I thought was a great environment. Dealing with people's baggage around art is particularly challenging. They really think. Um, they think they're either going to be taken advantage of, they're going to be treated badly, or that there's some book or something that they have to know in order to respond to it that they haven't read yet. And it was very hard in, in, in the context of a gallery to communicate with them. It turned out that sort of a newsletter, in the beginning, I always wrote a newsletter introducing an edition. Um, <clears throat> this was a great way to talk to people about art in a way that was like very respectful about presenting the artists and their practice but also very approachable and very human. And um, it was a voice that I sort of gained from years of blogging. Um, but <clears throat> it also turned out, and I sort of think the intimacy that you feel with your email in your inbox, there's like a privacy and there's also like a feeling of like, you know, nobody's looking over your shoulder, you hope. Um, and <clears throat> the other thing about it too is that it meant that people who got on the mailing list were looking at art a couple of times a week. And you know, to this day, sometimes people will write to me and they'll say, I really hate this piece of art that you showed. And I'm like, embrace that feeling. Tell me why you hate it. Because having the confidence to have taste, know what your taste is, and express it is a really it's an important part of becoming a collector. Um, the other thing that you'll see about this, I mean, sort of looking at it, it's very consumer oriented. And that's because um, one of the things that I found very frustrating was that there are tons and tons of people in the world who would buy art if you would only try to sell it to them. And the opacity of the gallery and like the bullshit of the bazaar, neither one of those are appealing to people who are you know, in the middle of it. And that's sort of the, the, the world that I imagine is one where art collecting is something that people do in the same way that they read books or watch movies. And what gets me excited about that is the idea that there's an economy that emerges from that, and I think that we're seeing a lot of signs from that here, where artists make a living making work instead of having day jobs and doing a million other things, and where people are spending money on something that is actually patronage every time they, every time they buy something from us, the artist gets a check. Um, every time they get a piece of artwork, they have a story that comes with that and an artist statement, and they're hearing more. It's, a, it's, it's just a very different, much richer experience than say, buying a poster at IKEA. Again, um, sort of looking at a very consumer-oriented, you know, browse by color is completely verboten in the art world. And um, it's something, like, God forbid, you should be able to look for something by a color. But one of the things that I've said in the newsletter over and over again is, like, it's a great place to start. I expect that you're going to want to go deeper once you've gotten the red thing that you love or the green thing that you love. But actually, like, it's OK to like a color. And it's OK to want something that's a certain color. And I can't tell you how many relieved emails I've gotten from people. Like, I didn't know that that was OK to like, like something because it was green. It is OK. Um, and I, I, think that, I think it's important also to realize that one of the reasons that I was able to do this is that um, at the same time and all the way through, I opened the gallery in 2003, it's still open today, and people always ask me, like, are you going to close the gallery? 
now. It's a really important part of our ecosystem. Um, it's very important that we um, continue to deepen our relationship with the traditional art world, that it's important for us in terms of keeping us honest and keeping us relevant in that part of the world. It's important for our artists. And it's, in, it's important also to be a step on the path from the, the 20 or $24 print to the $2,000 print and to the original painting. And we've had many instances, actually, where people who start with the very inexpensive prints come in and buy stuff from the gallery. Um, I am a middleman, middle woman, um, and that's OK. So a lot of what people are talking about here, and I think that a way that we're very different than Etsy and Kickstarter, which are tools that a lot of the artists that we work with use, is that um, it's a curated site, and we actually manage um, the, the production of the prints with the artist supervision, the shipping, the customer service. Um, all of that stuff is handled by us with a consumer in mind and meeting those consumer expectations so that we don't lose people. And I think that's something that's very hard for an artist to do. And I also think it's something that an artist shouldn't have to do. Um, and I was really excited to sort of hear this come up and, uh, again and again in the presentations yesterday, which is sort of understanding what are your core competencies and what should you outsource? And I sort of feel like as it pertains to artists and artwork, you should outsource as much of it as you possibly can that isn't actually making work. Because there's a lot of things that I can talk about when I talk about an artist that are kind of uncomfortable for the artist to talk about themselves. And um, I also think that like an artist who thinks about you know, supply chain efficiency and like scaling production and buying packing materials, it's not a great use of your time. Um, and um, now we're going to take a little visual break. I'm going to take you through a bunch of the additions. This is an uh, artist that we work with, William Palhaida, uh, a, a sort of tongue-in-cheek why you should buy art um, print that's all sold out now. Uh, James Deven, who's a British photographer who I've worked with for many years. <clears throat> this is actually like a very satisfying addition to have released because it was something that we had in the gallery that people fell in love with but didn't purchase. And when we released it and made it available online um, with you know, an 8x10 version that was $24, $24 and a 30x40 um, version that was $2,000, like wouldn't you know it, like a lot of people bought the $2,000 version on the internet um, after like scores of people coming through the gallery and looking at it and not getting it because they'd been sort of part of this experience with 20 by 200 for a long time and they saw it and they're like I like it I know I like it I trust 20 by 200 and like going ahead and making that purchase Michelle Muldrow who's a, a painter who we represent at the gallery who we've also done additions with Joe Holmes um, a photographer uh, who <clears throat> aside from being someone who exhibits at the gallery is probably uh, one of the most successful artists on 20 by 200 another Mike Montero which I have up in my house because, you know, fuck it. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, sort of going back to what I was just saying before, like, there's a lot of stuff that I feel like I should be able to do for an artist that they can't do for themselves. Uh, one of the things that happened when I first started 20 by 200 um, where this like revolutionary idea of like selling a print very expensively, inexpensively, um, people looked at it and they're like, I could do that. But actually like an artist doing it themselves couldn't. Like they couldn't print a print at a cost that would make it possible for them to sell it that much because they weren't doing the aggregate volume that, that we were doing. Um, they also couldn't actually um, you know, a lot of what we do sort of because we're a curated platform is we're validating an artist by presenting their work and giving them contents, like content, like curation, um, context, rather. Curation is really important. Um, I think that one of the most exciting things that an artist ever told me, um, and I'm not making this up, and I am bragging a little, I can't help it. Um, she said that she was sitting with a group of artists who've worked on 20, who've done editions with us, herself included, and that they decided that it was the equivalent of getting a Guggenheim grant, which is like pretty spiffy. <laughs> Not just because of the money, though. The money is obviously like crucial and important, but also because of the recognition that they got. Also because it's, it, got, it, it meant that they got to say that they were a part of this community of artists that we've selected 
and that their work was being presented in a very thoughtful, um, analytical perspective. You know, those newsletters, um, as casual and offhand as they might seem sometimes, there's a lot of information in them about the art and the artist. And, um, you know, it's nice to have somebody writing about your work and presenting it to an audience of people that you could never reach yourself. Um, and having someone talk about you to that audience is actually, in, in some instances, many more, many, much more effective than you talking yourself. Um, this is a, this is a series um, from uh, Aaron Strap Cope and uh, Stamen, a series that we've done of pretty maps. We actually have a new, uh, a, a new series accompanying it as well that went out. I think that Matt maybe had a print in his presentation yesterday from the watercolor series that we're doing. Little baby animals. Kids like them. A painter, Elizabeth Huey, that we work with. Um, I had an advantage of being second mover here um, because uh, I know that there was a lot of conversation yesterday about how money is, is not awesome. Um, I stand before you as someone who really didn't have money for a long time and it sucked. Like, it was really, really hard and it was distracting and it was painful um, and, uh, and it, you know, and it actually kind of makes me crazy that there is this sort of conceit that artists shouldn't talk about money, they shouldn't worry about money, um, and that they shouldn't correlate making money to their work. I understand why it exists, but at the same time, like if you're not making money from your work, if you're not making a living, it's very hard to survive. And I will say also that if you look at, um, you know, play a word association game with me, which is like collector, wealthy, artist, starving. Like, there's something wrong with that picture, and I feel like, to a certain extent, like an artist is not supposed to feel like they're successful if they're making money in, in this weird way, or they're not supposed to talk about it. And like, I really want that part of their existence to be taken care of, and I want it to be taken care of with them making work and getting it out there and getting it into people's hands. Um, this is actually a great example. Um, this is uh, George Colombo. He actually made these um, drawings on his iPhone. Uh, I'm not even going to mention the app because what has happened with this is that instead of people going and buying art from George Colombo who made this with an app, people go buy the app because like my kid could do that, right? But actually then they like go and they get the app and they're like, oh wait, that's really hard. But, but you know, like part of it is too that for somebody like George, he didn't really have an avenue through which to release the editions, to market them and sell them. So it was, um, it was great to be able to create an audience for the work, and we also did a book with him uh, last year. So um, this is Clifton Burt, who's a local, a local uh, Portland artist and designer. La Paz. This is a Swiss Miss, her, her ideal bookshelf. And Paul Octavius, um, who's another person that a lot of people probably know here. Um, sort of wrapping it up, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, our little idea that started five years ago is working. We've released over 800 editions with 300 artists, 180,000 prints to 42 countries all over the world. Um, I like to think of those as 180,000 stories because each of those is going into someone else's hands and it's becoming something new. And then we're paying artists as well, which is really exciting. Um, uh, writing checks to artists is one of my favorite things to do. And writing substantive checks on a regular basis is sort of what we seek to do in the long term. And with that, I exhort you to get excited and make things. <laughs>